Ads heard before, during, or after the podcast are not endorsed by Paranormality Magazine or myself unless voiced by me personally. All other ads are pre-recorded, inserted by ad agencies, and are not under our control. Welcome to Paranormality Magazine. Each week, Paranormality Magazine explores all Fortean subjects, from phantoms to UFOs and every cryptid creature in between. Each week, you're treated to a collection of well-researched and investigated stories, interviews, and reports on cutting-edge paranormal projects and topics they know you crave. And here in the podcast, I share stories from the magazine to give you just a taste of what you receive in every issue. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Paranormality Magazine. It's no secret that the Isle of Wight is one of the most haunted islands in the world. Castles, manor homes, hospitals, pubs, roads, cliffs, everywhere you look, the island is overflowing with creepy tales of ghostly apparitions and disembodied voices. It's more difficult to find a part of the island that doesn't have a ghost story than one overflowing with eerie local legend. One particular paranormal hotspot, the former county asylum Whitecroft Hospital, is apparently haunted by not one, but dozens of ghosts. Michelle Fisher brings us the story. Prior to the construction of the former Whitecroft Hospital, patients from the Isle of Wight had been sent by boat to Knoll Hospital on the mainland outside Portsmouth. But due to overcrowding at Knoll in the early 1890s, as well as additional hospital fees for island patients, a proper asylum based on the island became a necessity. After securing a building location outside of Newport, construction on the island's own asylum began in 1894. The hospital, then called Isle of Wight Lunatic Asylum, admitted its first patients in 1896. In total, the construction of the hospital cost around 60,000 pounds, not including the equipment, and could house approximately 310 patients. At the beginning of its first year, Wycroft Hospital had 202 patients, with the number increasing to 304 by the end of 1897. In 1899, the majority of patients were committed to Wycroft for mania, 49 men, 93 women, with the second highest number, 31 men and 60 women, committed for dementia. By 1927, there were 328 patients, 119 men, 209 women, at Whitecroft, and occupational classes had commenced where women were taught handiwork, basket making and knitting, and male patients worked on the farm or in the tailor's shop, carpenter's shop, or the engineering department. As with Knoll Hospital 40 years earlier, Overcrowding became an issue at Whitecroft in the 1930s. During the outbreak of World War II, the hospital had an overwhelming 400 patients, requiring an additional 40 beds to be squeezed into the recreation hall. However, by the end of 1975, only 270 of the then 410 remaining beds were occupied, placing Whitecroft among the lowest occupancy rates in England and Wales. During the 1980s and 1990s, Asylums across the country were closing as regular hospitals were better equipped to help former asylum-bound patients. The decline of the asylum in the United Kingdom was also attributed to the passing of the Mental Health Act in 1893 and the care in the community policy of deinstitutionalization, which allowed some patients to be cared for in their own home. The time of Victorian lunatic asylums was long over, and Whitecroft Hospital officially closed its doors to inpatients in 1992, after nearly a century of service. For the next two decades, the buildings sat abandoned. The hospital has since been converted into luxury flats and renamed the more appealing Gatcom Manor. Due to its designation as an important historical property, the building has retained most of its original windows and door joinery, as well as architectural details. The flats, however, maintain little resemblance of their former selves offering a spacious and contemporary living space. 
and at the center of the development, surrounded by newly built homes and converted nurses' quarters, stands the historic Grade II listed clock tower surrounded by a lovely residence garden. From the very vague records we were able to track down, it doesn't appear that there was any disclosed malicious activity occurring at Whitecroft Hospital. While our definition of mental health and how we treat patients has changed significantly since Whitecroft's time, the hospital's history doesn't match the asylum stereotypes often present in film and literature. We can thank Bedlam Royal Hospital in London for those popular tropes. For instance, I haven't seen any evidence of things like electrotherapy and lobotomies occurring at Whitecroft. But nothing has really been made public on the lives and experiences of the individual patients, so it's difficult to get an idea of what treatment and daily life was like outside of generalized administrative records. So can Whitecroft's ghosts shed some light on the nature of the hospital's past? As popular culture has taught us, any former insane asylum has its fair share of ghost stories, and Whitecroft Hospital is no exception. According to local legend, there are ghosts lurking around pretty much every corner, making it one of the most haunted buildings on the entire island. And the hauntings didn't begin after the hospital closed in 1992. A resident at the hospital in October 1984 allegedly saw a misty white figure standing at the end of their bed sometime between 9 p.m. and 10.30 p.m. Two other residents reported seeing a man with no eyes wandering around the premises on two separate occasions. During recent renovations, builders claimed to experience a number of strange phenomena on the property. Many have said they felt as though they were always being watched, and others claimed to feel tapping on their shoulder by someone or something that wasn't there. Other builders have told stories of seeing the ghosts of former nurses walking around, as if the hospital was still open for business. It's said that the base of the clock tower is one of the most active places for unexplained activity, and some builders apparently refuse to work anywhere near that area of the site. A number of witnesses have also reported seeing the ghost of a former doctor wandering through one of the property's car parks and occasionally peering into the windows on the ground floor before vanishing. A little invasive for whoever bought the ground floor flats, Another ghostly doctor's been spotted rushing through the former first-floor wards wearing a dark suit and cravat with a head of unkempt hair. He's often seen followed by another figure, thought to be his assistant. The former nurse's quarters is apparently also filled with paranormal activity, with reports of doors frequently opening and closing by themselves. Gatcombe Manor, the transformed relic of Whitecroft Hospital, stands as a testament to the island's haunted legacy. While historical records may not reveal the sinister practices often associated with asylums, the reported hauntings speak of lingering spirits and spectral echoes. As we unravel the tales of misty white figures, eyeless apparitions, and ghostly doctors, we contemplate the shadows that whisper the untold history of Whitecroft, forever etched in the fabric of the Isle of Wight. Here's a glitch in the Matrix story from Reddit user DisastrousBabe90. This happened a few months back, but I'm new to Reddit, so I'm just now finding a place to post about it. It was really weird, and I still think about it sometimes. A few months ago, my boyfriend and I were coming home from a trip to visit my family. We live in a small second-floor apartment that overlooks our parking lot. We were unpacking the car, bringing stuff upstairs little by little, and my family had sent us with a lot of food, so one load we brought up all had to be unloaded into the fridge. As I was unloading the food, my boyfriend was standing at the counter and we were having a full conversation. I don't remember exactly what we were talking about, but it was something you wouldn't just walk away from. Anyways, he's standing there, and as I'm talking, I turn around to put something in the fridge, but when I looked back, he was gone. I was confused because, again, we were in the middle of a conversation, but I was like, is he hiding from me? Is he playing a joke? So I started laughing and looking for him around the apartment. After a few minutes, I was like, what the heck is going on? Because he was nowhere to be found. Sometimes he steps onto the patio to smoke, so I opened that door, and while he wasn't on our patio, I saw him downstairs unloading the car. 
I was really confused about how he got downstairs so fast and why he left in the middle of our conversation. Well, he came back up a few minutes later and had to knock because apparently the front door was locked and he didn't have his keys. How did the front door get locked with him outside without keys and me not knowing that somehow he left? The front door is in the kitchen I was in. I would have heard the door open and close, but I heard or saw nothing if he had left. I was also just literally putting something down in the fridge, so I had my back to him for like a split second. How could he possibly get to the door so fast and I didn't see anything? None of it makes sense to me, and when I asked him about it, he had no idea what I was talking about and had no memory of our conversation while I was unloading food. So strange. Time. We all wish we had more of it, swiftly moving forward in a never-ending stream where the present is the past and the future is now. Or is it? Even scientists still don't understand what time is as a whole because time behaves a bit differently in some circumstances. Did you know that clocks on planes and satellites record time 90 billionths of a second faster than someone who's standing on the Earth? So, if time can change speed, could it crack, creating a time slip? Well, I guess that depends on who you ask. There are millions of people from all over the world who have shared their time slip experiences. One of the more notable stories is that of a man named Frank. It was July 1996, and Frank, a police officer in Liverpool, and his wife Carol were heading to Bold Street to do some shopping. When they got to Central Station, they split up. Carol went to Dylan's bookshop and Frank went into a music store to buy a CD. As Frank was stepping onto Bold Street, he noticed it was quiet, a complete void of sound. Then suddenly he heard a horn coming from beside him. He turned sharply and looked to see what it was. Frank was in disbelief when he saw a 1950s box delivery truck speeding past him. As the truck was driving off, he noticed that it said, Kaplan's on it. Frank looked down to see that he was no longer standing on the sidewalk. He was now standing in the road. Completely bewildered by what was going on, he headed across the street to see that Dylan's bookshop was now a woman's boutique. Frank then started looking at the people around him, and he said that everyone was wearing clothing from the 1940s. All of a sudden, Frank spotted a young girl in her 20s wearing a lime green sleeveless top and she was carrying a handbag that had a popular brand name on it from the 1990s. The young girl headed into the boutique, and Frank followed her in, still confused as to where the bookshop went. As soon as Frank stepped through the threshold, everything flashed back to normal. The young girl turns around to leave, and Frank lightly grasps her arm and asks, "'Did you see that?' She replied, "'Yeah, I thought it was a clothes shop. I was going to look around, but it's a bookshop.' Afterward, Frank did some research on what had happened to him, only to find out that Cripps and Kaplan's were businesses based in Liverpool during the 1950s. Did Frank go back to the 50s for a brief time? I'd like to think so, because Bold Street in Liverpool is a hot spot for time slips. It's such a popular area that there are several YouTube channels and Facebook pages about the strange events that happen on Bold Street. There's even a subreddit. Another interesting and credible story that happened on Bold Street is one of a shoplifter who not only slips the security guard chasing him, but also found himself in 1967. Sean, who, while shoplifting in Liverpool back in 2006, ran away from a security guard and headed down Hanover Street. Frantically trying to lose the guard, the 19-year-old ran down a dead-end street called Brooks Alley. By this time he was out of breath and started to get a tight sensation in his chest. He soon realized that it wasn't a problem with him, but the atmosphere around him. Sean waited for the guard to come around the corner looking for him, but he never did. So, thinking he'd given him the slip, he hesitantly walked back out of the dead-end street and started to walk down Hanover Street again, but he soon realized that something wasn't quite right. The road looked different, as did the pavement. He noticed cars driving by that looked very old-fashioned and the modern road was now gone. 
Soon, Sean saw that the people around him were wearing strange clothes. When he crossed over to Bold Street, he noticed there were traffic lights where they weren't before, along with bushes growing around the Lyceum. He carried on walking, realizing that something was odd. Then he began to panic. Sean realized that somehow he had stepped back in time. Then he remembered his cell phone. Taking it out of his pocket, he tried to get a signal, but of course it didn't work. At this point, Sean was in a panic. He spotted a kiosk selling newspapers. Leaning over the stand, he took a look at the front page of the Daily Post. There, in bold lettering, was the date, 18th May 1967. He wondered what to do. What happens if he can't get back to his own time? What about family and friends? So, speeding up his pace, he reached H. Samuels, the jewelers, and tried his phone once again. This time it worked. With a sigh of relief, he looked around to see that he had returned to the present. But the strange thing was Sean could still see people walking around in 1967 when he looked down Bold Street. Sean had seen and had enough and dived onto a bus to go home. He was interviewed by the local newspaper four times and had the same story. Now, you're probably wondering how a story of a shoplifter is a credible account of a time slip. Well, the story doesn't end there. When the security guard was interviewed, he stated that when he ran after Sean and turned down the dead-end alley after him, Sean had completely disappeared. Then when the newspaper checked out the facts of Sean's story, they found that everything he said was historically accurate. So what makes Bold Street such a hot spot for time slips? The journalist from The Echo in Liverpool who interviewed Sean said, "...there have been many time-slip incidents reported in this area near Bold Street, and I believe there is actually a crack in time in the vicinity." Others believe that it's caused by Liverpool's subway systems. The subway runs in concentric circles beneath Bold Street, which may cause high amounts of energy to form a vortex to another time. After doing a bit more research on Bold Street, I found that it had a very colorful history. Bull Street was originally laid out as a rope walk, a long, thin area of land uses for the manufacture of rope, which was the catalyst for it to be known as the Rope Walks. Back in the 18th century, sailors used the street to measure out rope for the sailing ships needed for the busy port industry. After that, it was the center of the slave trade in Liverpool. After the slave trade ended, the street started to transform into housing and shops for the merchants who worked the dock. I think if you take the fact on not only the spiritual energy along with the energy produced by the subway system, that might just be enough to cause a crack in time. Chris Gibson is the founder of a community and construction project called Future Liverpool. In 2010, Chris and his colleague were in the basement of one of the Bold Street shops. They found a disturbing message written on the wall. It said, God have mercy on all who enter here, May 2, 1966. Written underneath that, it's no joke, December 9, 1969. Want more Paranormality? Subscribe to Paranormality Magazine, and each month get it delivered digitally or via mail in our print version. Paranormality Magazine is a collaborative endeavor featuring works from people like you who have a passion for all things mysterious and unexplained. Our goal is the pursuit of knowledge, gathering captivating stories from our own team of writers, researchers, and investigators, as well as from writers such as yourself. Each monthly issue also includes a list of paranormal, horror, UFO and cryptozoology events around the country, incredible paranormal-themed artwork, articles and writing sent in from our readers, suggested books and podcasts to consume, and more. Visit ParanormalityMag.com and subscribe today for as little as $3.99 a month. That's ParanormalityMag.com. ParanormalityMag.com. What you're about to hear is a controversial tale about organized crime. 
Sources say that unspeakable torture was carried out on children by the U.S. government. This story, which has been the subject of heated debate, speaks of kidnapped children, mind control tactics, gruesome man-eating monsters, and a band of men in dark suits who executed the most disturbing, government-funded experiments on the lives of innocent children. Molly Briggs brings us the story of time travel, psychic powers, psychological torture, tales from the Montauk Chair. Montauk Air Force Station sits at the tip of Long Island in New York State. Created by the U.S. Army in 1942, it's been at the center of controversy since its conception. The military base, then called Fort Hero, was joined shortly by the United States Air Force and renamed Camp Hero. These two branches of the U.S. military shared the base until the Army stepped away in late 1950. The once Cold War defense base, disguised as a fishing village, would from then on be known as the Montauk Air Force Station. Although, if you were one of the almost 100 children stolen from the area of Montauk, you would have soullessly called it hell. Preston Nichols was one of those kids. Sources say that more than 70 boys were taken over a period of 10 years. Because of the covert nature of the project, it is still unclear what the program's goal was. What we do know is that the Montauk boys' unceasing nightmares don't care about the why. In his book, The Montauk Project, Experiments in Time, published in 1992, Preston Nichols recounted what he remembered during his time inside the underground bunker beneath the military base. Nichols refers to being placed in a Montauk chair, a chair that was allegedly outfitted with electromagnetic technology, allowing government agents to heighten the children's psychic abilities. One of the boys, Duncan, was said to have been able to conjure objects just by thinking about them. Another strange experiment, called the seeing eye, allowed the test subject to see through another's eyes. According to reports, Duncan would become the target person. He would feel through their body, hear through their ears, and see through their eyes. The target subject could be anywhere in the world. Once located beneath what some locals call Long Island's Area 51, the Montauk chair yielded time travel anywhere in the world. At least one of the boys claimed the chair could transport its test subjects to Mars. Ironically, it was the discovery of time travel that spooked the sinister scientists enough that in 1983 the project was shut down for good. The collection of cruel experiments happening at the mysterious base came to be known as the Montauk Project. The events took place, according to a handful of men, between 1971 and 1983, although the project was never officially proven after the release of Preston Nichols' book, multiple people have come forward to corroborate his story. At least one of the Montauk boys recalled powerful frequencies being used on him to affect mind control in an underground concrete facility. Montauk area native Joe Lafreno claims to have been abducted by government officials. He says he was taken between 1980 and 1981. The man, now in his 50s, was experimented on at the Montauk Air Force Station. He recalled grueling tests being done on him against his will. At the time of the terrifying events, Lufreno would have been between 12 and 13 years old. Under hypnosis, the man recalled being lured to the base by a loner boy slightly older than him. Once the boys passed the security gates, Lafreno was snatched up by two men in dark suits. Walking for some time, he was led down a dark path to what appeared to be a sunken home with a collapsed roof. Lafreno remembers blacking out but can't remember leaving the premises. Curiously, Lafreno recalls standing in front of Preston Nichols in a concrete room. He also spoke of seeing approximately 70 other boys in the underground facility. The boys were all dressed in the same clothing. It's important to remember the details of his story surfaced in 1992, well before the advent of Netflix. Another bone-chilling experiment performed on the boys included being naked and strapped down to a table. Lafreno remembered wires attached to his head and body in an underground bunker that he believed to be beneath the camp radar tower. What makes the strange story even more curious is that 
all of the victims Lafreno recalled seeing were male. Is it possible the military was experimenting on boys to create some sort of embryonic super-soldier? An experiment reiterated by the men that could prove the super-soldier theory involves the agents giving each of the boys a gun. The boys were instructed to shoot directly at the back of the live human head. Thankfully, according to what surfaced during a hypnosis session, Lafreno merely sensed he was shooting at a live human head. The target was, in reality, a dummy. Joe Lafreno says the horrific experiments that took place at the Montauk Air Force Base still haunt him today. He continues to suffer terrible nightmares and calls the U.S. government agents responsible for the gut-wrenching crimes against innocent children evil, horrible creatures. It has been said that the secret underground bunker was shut down and filled with cement. It's also noted that most of the people connected to the project were psychologically programmed to forget the experiments and events completely. A similar tactic is reportedly used on victims of UFO and alien abduction. And what became of the dreaded Montauk chair? As the story goes, when the project ended, a monster was released from the Montauk boy, Duncan's subconscious. The monster nefariously roamed the multi-purpose base without anyone knowing when or where the dreaded beast would reappear. Preston Nichols claimed that to thwart the hungry man-eating monster, he was called to smash the Montauk chair to bits, sending the hairy beast into the netherworld. On an interesting side note, Preston Nichols and others stand by their experiences at Camp Hero, aka the Montauk Air Force Station. However, Nichols' book is touted by some as a work of fiction. Wikipedia, the least reliable, completely biased information hub on the face of the planet, calls Nichols' book a work of fiction because the entire account was fabricated by Preston Nichols and, to some extent, Stuart Swerdlow. He just wanted to become famous in the New Age community. Okay, it's here where I say that, as one who dwells within the New Age community, I would liken making up a story as morbidly detailed as the Montauk Project with the hopes of gaining fame within our motley crew of wayward nymphs to peddling a Fabergé egg at a blue-collar Yankee swap. It doesn't add up. It's like baking a seven-tier wedding cake for a three-year-old's birthday party minus Baron Trump. There's just no need to overdo it. As long as you show a little effort, the paranormal community is kind of a sure thing. Putting another log on the project's validity fire will recall what Ellie Crystal of the Manhattan-based TV show The Metaphysical Experience had to say. In speaking about the synchronicities of the Montauk Boys, she said, people with the same memories who didn't know each other trickled into each other's lives. Now that's got to account for something. In the end, the tragic story is told, and the government's secret is out. A happy ending at last? No, not really. No one will ever know the real story behind the events surrounding the Montauk Project. The group of less-than-lucky Montauk boys will forever be known as the brave, unfortunate recipients of the bizarre crimes inflicted upon them by the U.S. government. Or maybe they are truly just a group of mixed-up, middle-aged, mentally ill men conjuring up bizarre stories looking for their 15 minutes of fame. That's the easier story, right? The less complicated one. The one that allows us all to lay our heads on our pillow at night. As with all things, it's your own personal experience in life that will fuel which side of the fence you land on. Author and Montauk boy Preston Nichols died in 2018 from complications related to a heart attack. He was 72. One of the most haunted roads in America lies within the limits of Adam County in Thornton, Colorado. Riverdale Road is a winding country road covered in native grasses, cottonwood trees, and tall yellow street signs that warn leadfoot thrill seekers of potential trouble. But is the difficult road the real danger in the sleepy town of Thornton, Colorado? The stoic yellow signs posted along the narrow road help drivers prepare for challenging turns. But what about preparing for a challenge that's more terrifying in nature? Molly Briggs tells us about 11 miles of terror. 
Throughout history, spooky tales of a haunted jogger, a ghost lady in white, and even a ghostly apparition of a phantom Camaro have circled the quiet mountain town for many years. Conversations surrounding the winding 11-mile stretch of road have managed to horrify people with whispers of murder, hangings, and betrayal for decades. But what happened in this quaint Colorado town? Why do so many ghostly apparitions from days gone by still linger here? To answer that question, instead of driving down Riverdale Road, for now we'll have to take a trip down memory lane. The town of Thornton sits just seven miles outside of Denver, Colorado. Thornton was solely farmland until 1953 when the first plot of land was purchased, sparking the beginning of the first planned community. However, let's go a little further back to 1859, when David Wolpert made his way west with 16 other people looking for land, gold, and the promise of a new life. David may not have found the gold he was looking for, but he found something of equal measure. Love. In 1864, David married Catherine Henderson and built a house, including an underground chicken coop, on 9190 Riverdale Road. However, as the old saying goes, no honeymoon lasts forever, and David found himself in a bit of bad fortune. The chickens wouldn't grow to full maturity, and the crops in his field would wither away before they were ready for harvest. But in less than a year, things were looking up, and the newlywed couple grew to three as they welcomed a son. The stress of the farm still looming, David recalled sinister stories of witches around town and decided to enlist the help of Satan. Walking on the dark side, David drew satanic symbols on the floor and walls of the underground chicken coop. It was inside the pen that he performed ritualistic ceremonies, chanted, and sacrificed his chickens, smearing the walls and his body with their blood. As with most small towns, whispers of his bizarre behavior emerged. Word traveled fast, and townspeople appeared at David's property, hoping to catch a glimpse of the devil himself. Attempting to keep the public at bay, David decided to build a gate. Broke, he made the structure out of whatever metal he could find. With the iron gate complete, the devil finally appeared and propositioned David. For a bountiful farm, he would have to burn down his home. I think we can agree that this proposal makes no sense but there is little about the angel of darkness that does. That night, David set his house on fire, trapping his wife and baby inside. The small boy and his mom perished among the flames, and David ran away, never to be seen again. The gates surrounding the perilous property would forever be known as the Gates to Hell. If you cross through the Iron Gates and walk toward where the two-story brick mansion once stood, the smell of smoke is said to engulf you. Distant footsteps and tortured female screams are also said to be part of the spooky fanfare. The area around the Wolpert home, for over a hundred years, has been known to locals as a meeting place for witches or anyone interested in conjuring up evil spirits. Strange things are said to happen along the road near the old property. A lady in white is seen roaming, flagging down motorists, seemingly looking for a ride although, as the Good Samaritan rolls to a stop and opens his door, no one is there. Others have reported seeing the ghostly figure of a woman in white reflected in their rearview mirror as they make their way down the highway. It's speculated that the ghostly apparition is Catherine Wolpert herself, who's looking for her baby. Or might she be looking for an explanation from David? Late at night, as the moon peeks out from behind the clouds, Paranormal enthusiasts have captured a glimpse of a young boy sliding his bloody handprints along the road signs. However, the following day, the pint-sized prints have disappeared. There have been strange stories worldwide about objects being haunted. Haunted items, big and small, are supposedly occupied by evil spirits ready to scare the pants off unsuspecting mortals. Riverdale Road is a place that seems to be a hotspot for one such object a Chevy Camaro. As the story goes, in the late 1970s, a Camaro came barreling down the road, wildly speeding around the winding turns and smashed into a tree, killing the passengers inside. Although in another version the Camaro hits a jogger only to speed off, leaving the mangled, helpless marathon man to die alone. Since that night, 
A phantom car has been spotted traveling down the road. If you find yourself on Riverdale Road late at night, don't forget to check your rearview mirror. You'll recognize the ghost car by its one working headlight. However, if you're not allowed out after dark, have no fear. The phantom Camaro ghost car has also been known to appear during the day. A disturbing part of American history involves slavery, a serious failure of mankind that stretched out over many parts of the United States and Colorado was not immune to its unimaginable horror. At night, along the side of Riverdale Road, when the moon is full, some folks have seen the bodies of slaves and some say witches quietly swinging from the cottonwood trees. God rest their souls. Within the land of Riverdale Road, we've heard tales of sinister Native American shapeshifters lurking about the area, appearing to people in curious ways. When you venture out into the land beyond the road, just make sure to remember if you encounter something unusual, run. There's no telling what tricks may befall you at the hand of these Native American sorcerers. It's here where I offer a parting gift. The truth about Riverdale Road. Although it is not lost on me that there are plenty of reasons to believe that there could be some very sinister things going on there at 9190 Riverdale Road, I wouldn't be doing any of us favors if I didn't execute some genuine digging. So even as the clock strikes midnight and I'd rather be in bed with my cat, I dig. The details surrounding who may have died at 9190 Riverdale Road are scant, to say the least trying to find sources for the ghost stories or even the names of the spiritual squatters have proven futile. What we do know for sure is that David Wolpert did actually exist, he did marry Catherine Henderson, and there was a house fire at 9190 Riverdale Road. A win, right? Not exactly. The fire didn't occur until 1975, over a hundred years after the legendary fire was said to have happened. The couple also had three children, not just one, and all five family members lived together in the home until after David and Catherine died and their children moved away. One more thing, and please don't shoot the messenger, there are no gates to hell. The notorious gates to hell over time have changed locations, with most people admitting they aren't able to track them down. However, as far as the gates that are connected to the legend are concerned, they simply don't exist they're just another prop in the maddening, eerie world of folklore. Spirits are energy, and energy is something that cannot be created or destroyed. It just is. So is there something strange happening on that long, dark, 11-mile stretch of road in Thornton, Colorado? Probably. But just who or what it is, we can't be sure. As with any long and winding road sporting tons of blind spots, there are bound to be multiple accidents resulting in even more fatalities, leaving the supernatural door open for spirits to roam until they come to terms with their unfortunate passing. But for some, that day may never come. There's also the matter of the clientele these sorts of hot spots may attract. Adventurers may be bringing their ghosts from home, not all paranormal enthusiasts are the same, and some dabble in these seriously dark arts, exciting the spirits who dwell in these sinister realms. This may lead to the risk of spirit attachment. Who's to say Riverdale Road hasn't turned into a paranormal bus stop, offering a ghostly hitchhiker a much-needed change? Whatever the case may be, Riverdale Road is a spot worth checking out. Some experiences wait for the right person to come along. I believe in the perfect storm, and sometimes it's about being in the exact right place at the exact right time for our ghostly visitors to reveal themselves. If you aren't sure that ghosts are lurking along Riverdale Road, go anyway. Venture out into the wilds of Colorado and look for legendary spirits. But for best results, keep the expectations to a minimum. Also, go because it's Colorado. If the spirits don't get you, the sheer beauty of the area will. Thanks for listening to Paranormality Magazine. Get more information about the magazine and subscribe to our monthly publication 
at ParanormalityMag.com. That's ParanormalityMag.com. Or click the link in the show description. And if you're a researcher or investigator, send us your stories. We might feature you in our next issue. If you have a paranormal podcast, you can add it to our website so our readers can find your show. And artists, if you'd like your work to be featured in our magazine or on our back cover, contact us. Again, our website is paranormalitymag.com. I'm Darren Marlar, and I'll have more paranormal for you next time from Paranormality Magazine.